Okay, so um, let's start talking about short-range weather forecasts, okay. so maybe a, a, you know, a few days ahead. So uh, let's imagine this is like putting the ball uh, up to the hole. All right. So here we are. Okay, like this that. is our forecast. This is our forecast, right. and, uh, and we'll see what happens. Okay, and whoa, pretty close. close. Okay, pretty close. <laughs> so we'll do that again. Okay, and uh, so oh, it's just missed. <laughs> but you can see the, the balls cluster around the hole pretty well. And we'll right. just do a third one. All right. And, uh, whoa. <laughs> okay, look, the, the inaccuracy, if you like, is pretty small at this range. In fact, it's so All small right. that even you could have a go and try and get it. Come on, it. let's have a go. go on, then. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to show that even an amateur can produce a reasonably accurate short-term forecast. We'll see. <laughs> now keep your head down. And, yeah, uh, a few tips would be handy. That's right, and give it a good bash. Whoa! Oh. <laughs> Straight Piece in the of hole. cake, short-term forecasting. The, the point is that because weather forecasting only has to look a few days into the future, it's relatively easy to be pretty accurate. All the forecasts are about the same. But then Tim introduces me to the T to take on the problem of forecasting climate years into the future. OK, well, oh, that's, wow. that's pretty good. That's gone oh, fairly straight. Yes. But let's, let's try it again. <laughs> Each time Tim hits the ball, it's like a different computer model trying to predict the future climate. Each model is slightly different, just as Tim's golf swing is never exactly the same. And because the models are trying to see so far into the future, these small differences have big effects. That's why the various climate models don't provide a consistent answer to how warm it's going to be in the future. So I'm getting the idea now that, that small changes here, they're going to have a big effect when it's way out there. They're going to have a big effect. And that's even with you as a skilled golfer. Well... The climate models at the moment, the computer models, can't give us a range any tighter than that big range we're seeing right up there, this 2 degree, 6 degree. We can't get that any tighter with the existing model. But we can deal with this problem to some extent by hitting not, let's say, two golf balls, but by hitting 50 golf balls. Tim keeps on hitting balls up the fairway, and eventually a pattern begins to emerge. And it's this pattern which Tim reckons holds the key to making a much more accurate climate prediction. What we can do is see how the balls cluster up there. And what that will tell us is a kind of probability that the weather will be such and such. Right. Uh, whatever time in the future we're, we're, we're interested in. OK. So we can look at the clustering of balls to give us a probabilistic estimate of the likely weather in the future. So if there's a bunching, bunching of balls in one area, that would represent the accurate forecast, if you like. That would represent the most accurate type of forecast we can make. Right. So there is a way to make a much more accurate prediction of future climate. Scientists just have to run their models thousands of times and see where the results cluster. But to do it takes an awful lot of computing horsepower. More than even Tim can muster. OK, Paul, so uh, this is, the, uh, this wow. is the computer. This is our supercomputer. It's uh, what does the uh, basic calculations for our weather forecast. It's absolutely massive. It's massive, yeah. yeah. What we're seeing here are thousands of individual processing units that together makes this, uh, you know, supercomputer, high-performance computer. So now, Paul, all of this is a computer. It's massive. Paul, this is only half of it. We've got another <laughs> half over here. Look. Good. We've got thousands more. So all of both these rooms, well, this is one big room I can see now. This is one huge computer. It's one huge computer, and we're basically talking about, you know, one of the top few uh, computers yeah. in the world. So when we talk about these multiple runs of, of forecasts, uh, wouldn't you just love to just run a world, you know, climate model through this hundreds yeah. of thousands of times? I mean, would that be possible? Well, we, you know, we, we would love to, we, you know, in principle, we could use these uh, computers to do climate forecasts. Yeah. But if we're really talking about doing ensembles of thousands of members, yeah. even something as big as this starts to become limited on what can be done. It's not big enough to do that job properly. Wow. It's frustrating. There is a way to come up with a more precise forecast of future climate, but it needs much more computing power than scientists have available. But there is someone I've come across who might have a different solution, even if it's not entirely conventional. And there's no supercomputers involved. 
So you need more computer power, so how did you come up with this idea? Well, I was uh, over one evening with a friend uh, uh, who was showing me, he's a computing enthusiast, and he was showing me a program which actually hadn't been released to the public at the time. He'd got hold of some early version of it, right. where they were looking for signals of extraterrestrial life. The search for ET involved continuously scanning space for a coherent radio signal, in amongst all the background noise. The trouble was, so much data was being generated every day, it was impossible for the scientists to analyse it all. So they hit on a brilliant idea. They parcelled up the radio signals and sent them out over the internet for people to analyse on their computers at home. Miles wondered if he could use the same method to run climate models. I have to admit, the initial reaction was pretty sceptical. I mean, <laughs> um, a, a lot of people just said, yeah, but you'll never get a, 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 a real three-dimensional climate model working yeah. on a PC. But Miles wasn't to be deterred. He and his team spent years trying to get massively complicated climate models to run on ordinary home computers. And as home computers became ever more powerful, they eventually confounded the skeptics. OK, well, come in here, and what you can see here is, yeah, we've actually got it working. I mean, all these, all these PCs, these are regular, ordinary pe personal computers, the yes. type you could buy in a, any computing shop, yeah. um, is running its own climate model. But it's the most complicated computer program of its type that's ever been run on a personal computer. So this, what's going on here? This is obviously the Earth. Yes. At different temperatures. But well, yeah, that's, this is you know, one version of the climate model that's being used to simulate how the planet could respond to right. increasing greenhouse gases. OK? Each PC is running a full-scale climate model. The graphics show the world's climate changing over time as global warming takes hold. You know, each one is running a slightly different version, so it's yeah. giving us a flavour for the range of possibilities for the future. Right, OK. So the secret of this, the reason we need to run the model so many times, is that that way we can look for what's most likely to happen over the next 50 years. No one model is perfect, but by running thousands of slightly different models, Miles can find out where the results cluster, and this will be the most likely forecast for future climate. I love it, Miles, because it's given me a real sense. In each one, this is someone's living room, this is someone else's bedroom, that's someone else's office. These are all ordinary PCs. Absolutely. Every Running with this and the combined power, it, it's the combination I'm really getting a sense of all of these results that give us an idea of what could and what is unlikely to happen in the future. It seems to be an idea whose time has come. Top scientific journals are publishing papers about it. It's being talked about in the media. And now Miles is ready to take it public. The experiment he's launching is to predict what will happen to global climate over the next 50 years. It's going to explore different scenarios, like what would happen if we cut emissions of greenhouse gases. So what he needs now is numbers. The more people that take part, the more accurate the predictions will be. And that's where I might actually be able to help. I've managed to get the BBC's mighty online department to have a look at Miles' experiment. They've simplified the procedure so anyone can join in. All you do is download the software, everything else happens automatically. And it won't interfere with your normal computing. It'll work in the background like a screensaver. Now, what do we need to get this thing kicked off? Well, in essence, we just need hundreds of uh, thousands of people to download this climate model, get it running on their personal computers, and put together all of their results. It'll give us the most comprehensive picture we've ever obtained on what the climate could do over the next 50 years. That's great. Now, how hard is it for someone to actually get involved in this? I mean, oh, you downloading this stuff, is it it's simple? absolutely simple. It's like, like any piece of commercial software. You just download it off the internet, right. double click, and off you go. It only takes 10,000 people to join in, yes. and you've already, you're already bigger than the world's biggest supercomputer. That's unbelievable. It, exactly. You know, when I started this journey, like a lot of people, I wasn't even sure if global warming existed. But when you see the disappearing glacier in Greenland, the vanishing ice shelves in Antarctica, and the hockey stick graph, 
It certainly convinces me. The only question is exactly how bad it's going to be. And now it looks as if we might even get an answer to that. And the biggest surprise for me is it's not the scientists who are going to provide the answers. It's you and me. So to find out how you can join in the biggest climate prediction experiment in the world, log on to the website now. It's www.bbc.co.uk forward slash climate change. It's on your screens right now. The way I see it, the planet belongs to all of us. But it's not often we get a chance to be involved in shaping its future. I'm hoping this experiment will change that. In a few months' time, we'll report the results in a special follow-up programme. Until then, it's over to you. <laughs>